Those who were part of a development team that had established its credibility were not only comprising a concept that would be otherworldly and meet such expectations of audiences who love survival horror, but also making such an impact on the genre for many years to come would undoubtedly be an understatement of the century. Team Silent laid the groundwork for others to pick off of if they were to pass the torch one day, and that they did. After becoming defunct and going their separate ways, Konami would make a decision, an important one at that, and choose a trustworthy developer who would be passed the mantle to continue Silent Hill. It was a decision that should have been easy and obvious as to choosing a Japanese developer who understood not only the material of Silent Hill, but also Japanese mythology, as much of the aspects and inspirations from the monsters are rooted in Japanese horror. It's what made the game so effective and engaging when capturing the player's attention with the otherworldly horror that they witnessed, but to everyone's shock, Konami would do the opposite and hire a western developer to hold the rights to the IP and continue working on developing the next melee entry to Silent Hill. This would go on to be a recurring trend for many years to follow. The first of many is Climax Studios, a Los Angeles studio that originally was developed at their branch in California but would be passed on to their Portsmouth branch in England. This was due in part to the California branch having to be closed down after facing issues with the game engine and struggling to capture the vision of the game. The script, monsters, and level design were redone, and the atmosphere and gameplay intentionally replicated those of the first Silent Hill game, which will be touched upon momentarily. One of the most notable features that I think anyone would come to find when it comes to Silent Hill Origins is not necessarily the origin itself, but rather the fact that it was served solely as a PSP title a portable experience of a Silent Hill title you can hold in the palm of your hand. I imagine it was much of a novelty to have back then, as it was the start of the rise of the portable handheld market that everyone wanted to take part in, but nowadays, I think it just remains that, a novelty. It still is a neat feature, nevertheless. In Silent Hill Origins, you play as the everyday man, Travis Grady, a truck driver who is driving to his intended destination and, in an impulsive decision, decides to take a shortcut to Silent Hill. As fate would have it, Travis would unknowingly almost hit the manifestation of Alessa's spirit. This would cause him to stop in his tracks and check on the girl, as any Samaritan would, and make sure she is okay. Huh? Hey, come back! This leads him to the house that is burning on fire, which would see him go into the fiery inferno to save the charcoal and burn Alessa after the ritual to impregnate her to give birth to a god from a cult, the Order, which happens to feature her mother, Dahlia, a prime suspect and the leader who cohorts the ritual in motion. Upon saving Alessa, Travis falls faint to awaken in the foggy town of Silent Hill. Here is where everything will get the memories going for all players like me who play the original Silent Hill. As an origin story would go, this would, of course, serve many callbacks and homages to the original as it takes place seven years prior. Much of the setting is rather the same, However, there are different locations to freshen up the experience and not repeat itself verbatim by recycling content. You will stumble upon Alcamela Hospital, one of the original locations where it would serve as the home for a hospitalized Lessa Gillespie while under the care of Lisa Garland. This is, from my understanding, the most notable callback to the original. With everything else being new, such as the sanatorium, theater, and Riverside Motel, in each of these locations, you'll see Travis stumble upon many of the monsters that appear in Silent Hill. Whether it's the foggy town or the other world where the player will see the likes of the nurses or the new monsters such as the carry-on. While here, Travis will have to go through each location by traversing the real world and other world via a mirror, a common featured element whether technical or metaphorical in the series, to collect items to either solve puzzles or battle in a boss fight in the aforementioned area. It will see Travis collect pieces to form the Floros, a device that suppresses Alessa's powers from becoming rampant, wrecking havoc across the town's inhabitants. This will serve as the driving force in the narrative to save Alessa, and stop the ritual from continuing and becoming finished by the Order. Much of the story in Silent Hill Origins was something that I found to be interesting at first glance because as someone who played the original Silent Hill, I grew to become intrigued by the mysterious ambiguous nature of not only the town's inhabitants, such as the Order and their ulterior motives and sinister intentions regarding this birth of a god to seek damnation over the world, but knowing how things started and came to be was a unique and fascinating idea. 
This was all intent and purpose in wanting to discover the town for what it is, and learning about the overall history serving the town's creation and how it came to be. However, this would go on to be the complete opposite of my expectations. What we got instead was a recycled story of one that we had seen before in the original Silent Hill. We've seen Harry Mason, the adopted father to Cheryl Mason, Lester's other half, travel to the town of Silent Hill, having to find his daughter after losing her and waking up in the town to go on this horrifying psychological journey of going to the fear of the unknown. He discovers the town's true intentions and learns about the Order, having to collect an anecdote of sorts to stop the ritual and save Cheryl. The same can be seen here with Travis. Much of his journey involves learning about the town's inhabitants and how the series of events came to be, having to undergo the hero's journey by summoning Alessa by collecting pieces for a device and purging her, which coincidentally stops the ritual. I think when this settles in, it could be seen as potentially lazy, copy and paste the same story but change it up a bit where it's valid enough to be its unique addition to the canon. But there is the argument that's slowly the point since it serves as a prequel. While this is true, much of this doesn't give more depth or reason to add more to the lore of Silent Hill. Sure, it does show the player the progression of how the events unfolded, such as Alessa split her other halves into two and how Harry Mason found Cheryl, which is neat, I suppose, but when you disregard these events and pretend Silent Hill Origins never existed, none of this affects the canon at all. It rather stays the same once again. Silent Hill similarly tells the same story, albeit better. Nothing truly changes as much of the cast of characters, story, and setting are featured once again in the first game. I think what would have been better in Silent Hill Origins is allowing the player to play from the perspective of a town inhabitant, someone who possibly was indoctrinated into the cult saw things unfold from the earliest beginnings of how the cult formed and how its influence spread over the town. Learning and exploring more about the town's history from an antagonist perspective would be fascinating for the player. Of course, I'm just purely spitballing ideas as to making a story that is worthwhile and different, but still inhibit those ideas and traits from the original material and can be still part of the Silent Hill canon. Overall, as much of it was a fun callback or homage to the original game, seeing the locations that gave us a sense of nostalgia from its atmosphere or the cast got the ball rolling for the events to unfold. I do think when you factor into the context of Silent Hill Origins, it doesn't do anything interesting or need to give incentive to truly call this an origin story since the player, if already played the aforementioned original Silent Hill, would come to find origins events told in the first game anyways. The gameplay is much of the same when it comes to the fundamentals that were found in the previous entries, incorporating survival horror elements that demand the player to utilize their resources with strategy in mind when combating against the monsters, traversing the town, or solving puzzles to unlock an item to progress. As mentioned, much of Silent Hill Origins wanted to cover the groundwork by paying respect to the source material. Facilitating the fixed camera angles depending on the environment allows for a dynamic camera when exploring the environment. Much of the environment is made to be familiar, yet incorporates new settings, which is refreshing since it allows incentive for exploration of your surroundings. The aforementioned sanatorium, theater, and Riverside Motel are some of the key notable features that come to mind. I found that these environments were very ominous in their tone, being ominous with the sound design incorporating to the decrepit and abandoned atmosphere that is plagued with the monsters roaming around these barren halls or rooms. You can see how much of the developers did their homework when immersing yourself in these environments as you slowly make your way cautiously when exploring and trying to complete an objective. One little neat detail is that it utilizes this mirror as a shift in transitioning between the real world and the other world. It's a novel idea that has been teased at the player in previous entries as mirrors played a symbolic and metaphorical role when contrasting with the protagonist you're playing as. Seeing this finally realized, even if it's just solely as a gameplay feature, it's still a neat detail in itself that I enjoyed seeing. I liked how Travis's body grew manipulated and contorted. How did you... I did find, however, the environments to drag on a bit. The most notable is the sanatorium. It was personally my least favorite to traverse through as it was very elaborate and overbloated with its many floors and rooms that got confusing over time, which is typical in these games, but more so than it needed to be. It kept this repetition of having you go grab a key item, go back to the mirror to traverse to the real or other world, solve a puzzle, and then finally fight the boss. It wasn't just specifically directed towards this location, but all of them. 
It often felt like much of a pushover to the extent that it felt much of the same and was never truly expanded upon. Combat is much of a reminder of the classic survival horror gameplay that is adjacent to the first game. Having tank controls, you can lock on enemies and attack them with a melee or firearm of your choice. The inclusion of variety when regarding the weaponry was a welcome addition, especially using your fists as a last ditch effort when all else is lost. Many of the weapons are varied and have become very vast when it comes to their overall environment. You will see many throwables and melee weapons scattered across the town that will always be awaiting the player and will never be hard to fail to see in your sights. I was genuinely surprised and taken aback by how much the game expands upon this. While all this is welcoming as it adds intuitiveness to the overall combat, I do think having too much of a good thing can become a bad thing. This is due to the overwhelming nature of how many weapons you have equipped into your inventory, and it can become forgettable to the player as you can grow attached to a weapon of your choice. Throughout most of my playthrough, I found that I only used a couple of varied weapons with the best stats regarding their design. As weapons have a durability limit, this is completely new to the combat that wasn't previously seen in the older entries. I believe that the mentality regarding this inclusion is that using one specific weapon would actually be against the player's favor, as it will break over time, allowing the player to learn from their mistakes of being dependent on one weapon and taking their arsenal for granted. But that's the problem. I found these weapons to be a cool idea, but poorly executed because they are overbearing for any player, regardless of whether they are a first time player or a veteran of the series. It also creates this dissonance to the survival horror element, as having too much at your disposal can create this confidence in your approach to combat, and disregard the horror completely. I didn't feel much tension or pressure when it came to the monsters. Sure, the design is very menacing in their appearance, but when you can stunlock an enemy and go into this continuous state, then it loses that credibility a bit. You can easily find yourself in this repetitive state of mashing the attack button and continuing this until the enemy is defeated. I had too much on my plate that felt like I was at an all-you-can-eat buffet of weapons, health, and ammunition I could have without any worrying on my part. This made me feel safe and comfortable. This is the complete opposite of what the player should feel in not just a survival horror game, but in Silent Hill. You're made to feel hopeless and desperate in your struggle for survival, while mustering the courage to be going against the unknown, and I didn't feel that here at all. Much of this access to resources could have been reduced to allow for much more incorporation of a player's approach to problem solving against an enemy, which allows incentive for creativity in their strategy. Having a limited capacity in a player's inventory would help induce that pressure and tension when it comes to combat, as you would feel equally matched with a monster and not feel overpowered. It reduces you back to a more vulnerable state and not only introduces the horror but immerses you into Silent Hill's atmosphere. If you want to access these weapons that are powerful or add more to your inventory, then make the player earn it and see that addition to their inventory as rewarding. Of course, difficulty setting can also be a key factor in this gameplay, but that isn't seen here, at least from what I've seen, unfortunately. This feeling pretty much cements my overall thoughts about Silent Hill Origins regarding its gameplay, story, and design. Much of these creative liberties are taken from an already pre-existing entry, original Silent Hill, that incorporates much of those design philosophies into this game, which feels like hopping and pasting. I feel that paying tribute and respecting to the source material is commendable things for any developer to do. It shows a sign of respect and regard for the content before it establishes its own identity. Although I don't see Silent Hill Origins creating much of its own identity, it solidifies much of that atmosphere from the original that never allows for much innovation. Maybe in the gameplay at some points, but that's very minor. Silent Hill Origins' biggest problem is that it plays it too safe and never allows room for growth. It feels like a shadow of its former self when putting the two side by side. Playing this game after a while made me think of how much I'd rather play Silent Hill instead. The characters are much of the same in their character development that is seen in the first game. They just feel like they are there and don't do much of anything new. The only difference is Travis, but even then he feels like a parallel to Harry Mason. Even the monster designs are much of the same with the only difference being that some of them are entirely new. But even that feels disingenuous as one of them is a clear copy of Pyramid Head that serves no explanation as to what its purpose serves, only there to be a reminder of the already pre-existing enemy that tries to replicate that experience solely for catering to fans. The story is much of the original as it follows a structure that feels too familiar. It has many ideas that inevitably fall into the footsteps of its former entry. 
I do think if you want an experience that closely resembles that of the original Silent Hill, then Silent Hill Origins does a serviceable enough job in providing that experience, and there isn't anything wrong with that. What makes Silent Hill Homecoming very profound to me is not necessarily the approach to the overall design philosophy that is embedded into its core as adopting the Silent Hill moniker, but rather the highly negative title it's been given by everyone who's experienced this game for themselves. To regard this title as the worst game in the franchise is inevitable. It's bound to happen as one doesn't fall too far from the bad apple that will undoubtedly mess up the infumble with a mistake or many mistakes somewhere down the line. It's quite the audacious statement for one to make. This negativity regarding Silent Hill Homecoming captivated me and engaged me to want to experience this game for what it had to offer, and why such an approach was made by those who played it left with such a sour taste upon finishing. Silent Hill Homecoming is next in line when it comes to being in the domain of a western developer. This would be Double Helix this time around. A merger between two previous companies would be a collective of those two companies' experiences in video games to collaborate and make something new for Konami. While this would come off as a positive prospect when considering such bold and tenacious aspirations, handing a developer that has little to no affiliation with the survival horror genre, but with such a demanding task of providing the next mainline entry in the Silent Hill franchise is quite an undertaking. And when you gather your thoughts upon experiencing Silent Hill Homecoming, you can see why. Much of the creative liberties regarding the design take many influences from the past mainland entries such as Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3 with its story and characters, as well as the movie adaptation with its approach to the horror atmosphere. Having such influences could be a good thing, but too many of those aspects coinciding with each other may become redundant. Two different approaches to horror as it becomes a culture clash, resulting in a recipe for disaster. In Silent Hill Homecoming, you play as Alex Shepard, a military veteran who just went unlisted for a service and travels back home to the town of Shepard's Glen to seek out his family. In this task, Alex finds himself in a horrifying scene that no one would ever want to wake up to. A mental institution that shows a much more sinister and vile atmosphere with the mutilation of children who were tortured and subjected to brutality behind the scenes unbeknownst to the player. Facilitating this environment, it's clear that Alex is clearly in the wrong place and wants to escape by any means necessary, to only stumble upon his brother, Joshua, who mysteriously appears of a very ambiguous yet ominous nature to him with his mannerisms and interactions of Alex. Trying to approach him will only see the kid escape and make Alex chase after him, a recurring trend that will become very evident to the player. Josh, wait! Alex has to find his brother and his whereabouts while traversing the town of Shepherd's Glen, meeting old faces from his past while undergoing psychological torment where he crosses the bounds of reality to a new nightmare in the other world. A familiar yet improminent environment that any Silent Hill fan immediately recognizes within a heartbeat. Within his journey, he will stumble upon his family and friends, alongside with the townspeople who play a pivotal role in the story. This is mostly due in part to where we see two sides, victims of the town who have no idea what is going on while you have the occupants who do, because they play a key role in their religious cult, the Order. This generally is the synopsis that you will mostly come to find with Homecoming that may come off as enticing, because it retains the Silent Hill atmosphere that conjoins previously established ideas, such as the aforementioned Other World, the religious cult The Order, and The Monsters. Three key foundations that would alarm anyone who has experienced these past titles. While this is all great in theory, the execution that Silent Hill Homecoming strives for falls flat. This is mostly due in part to such contexts the developers derive off of to not build upon it with their own unique or creative ideas, but rather utilize it for the worst as they try to rewrite those past events by applying their own to already existing canon. While this sounds like a genuinely innocent intent to the lore of Silent Hill, it comes off as one-sided and distasteful by misinterpreting those ideas that the previous titles established and making something that already worked not work. One example that comes to mind that isn't a surprise for no one is the inclusion of Pyramid Head. In the context of Silent Hill Homecoming, 
Pyramid Head is written off as a boogeyman, who is a monster slash manifestation that's created by the town as a punisher of quote unquote wrongdoers, based on the same executioners from the cult and the cult's mythology. It's mostly to coincide with Alex Shepard, as he isn't what he appears to seem further down in the story with the plot twist, revealing he was never in the military at all, and was rather sent to a mental institution due to accidentally killing his brother Joshua. What are you talking about? These are mine. I'm a soldier, just like you wanted. Alex, you've been in the hospital. I know. I was wounded in battle. No, a mental hospital. You've been there ever since the accident. This coincides with Alex as being a wrongdoer who needs to suffer for his crime and punishment for the act he committed. While this sounds reasonable, it is really just a shoddy attempt at rewriting a pre-existing antagonist to an already established character, James Sunderland, whose sole purpose of encountering Pyramid Head through his journey in Silent Hill 2 was for his repression of his guilt of his unforgivable act of killing his wife Maria. Pyramid Head is a physical manifestation of James's subconscious desire to be punished for his sins. It was a one-time thing that was never supposed to see Pyramid Head ever again. But due to the character's popularity, it was a marketing decision made by Konami that saw his persistent presence in the media. There are many instances of something like this in Silent Hill Homecoming, with the likes of the Bubblehead Nurses, the other world being simply a carbon copy of the original Silent Hill, with little to no direction to the town's inhabitants, or protagonist. The point I'm trying to make here regarding Silent Hill Homecoming's narrative is how it was conceived with the wrong direction, which lies in homages or callbacks as direct fan service that comes off as disingenuous when factoring the context of Silent Hill as a concept. I think the biggest missed opportunity here was the potential to utilize Alex Shepard's status as a wartime veteran who struggles and suffers from PTSD as an allegory for manifesting the town of Shepard's Glen given its psychological nature that inhibits elements of Silent Hill to project those traumas and fears against Alex with such creative liberties. It would have been an enticing and gripping narrative to evaluate the repercussions of spending time in the war and the damaging effects it can have on you mentally. It's such a missed opportunity that was there for the taking. Speaking of Alex's wartime experience, I say in air quotes, much of this is partially true when you factor in the concepts of his dad teaching him military fighting, which coincides with the gameplay greatly. Silent Hill Homecoming departs drastically from the fixed dynamic camera angles in movement, combat, and exploration in favor of the third person over the shoulder camera angle that quickly became the standard of survival horror titles back then, and even nowadays for a modern generation that was constantly progressing. It was a bit of whiplash to transition from the arcade controls of back then to the familiar feeling I experience nowadays. This was much of a welcoming addition as I've grown curious and fascinated at the idea of a modern Silent Hill title incorporating such innovative ideas into a new mainland title. Silent Hill Homecoming does this, for the most part, but feels very clunky and half-baked, inheriting ideas to give that innovation but failing in its execution. Much of this is seen in the overall gameplay, the most notable being the combat specifically. Much of that survival horror combat where you had to be strategic when approaching enemies carefully whilst studying their movements and attacks is seen here. However, much of this aforementioned combat is revamped to be updated to a more action-orientated approach where you see Alex utilizing much of his combat prowess and effectively utilizing it against the monsters. Locking on is fluid and smooth. Always keeping engaged with the enemy allows for movement to not just be walking cautiously while focusing but also evading or dodging, whether it's a combat role or pairing with your melee weapon. It uses much of the previous weaponry seen in previous titles, while including new ones that are short-range or long-range melee weapons. It can be dependent on the fundamentals of the monster that will require you to think as to how to approach them while using your arsenal, whilst switching to a firearm to cover ground as you can be overwhelmed easily as much of the time, the bombardment of enemies situated on the player's location can be unexpected entirely. This sounds ambitious and overwhelming because, for the most part, it is. Much of the combat engrossed me to try to pertain to the combat system that the game provides to the player, not necessarily because I was in favor in it, but more so out of frustration. Much of the time, enemies can be purely broken, sunlocking the player to where they can't evade the enemy's attack and find themselves sunlocked until they get a game over. These counters can be malicious when clashing against an enemy's attack, where using a long-range weapon or using a heavier attack 
as opposed to a light one is fortuitous because of that difficulty curve that is unwelcoming and unexpected. When you factor in the action-oriented gameplay, this is the feature that is a mistake in itself because it completely breaks the immersion that the player should feel when playing a Silent Hill title. The purpose of combat is to not feel this overwhelming dominance over your enemies, rather a glimmer of hope by combating the fear of the unknown by knowing what you got. The struggle in facing your fears of this lack of knowledge in combat immerses the player in survival horror, feeling the incentive to adapt to their surroundings of what little they know and use what they know effectively. Having a protagonist who is knowledgeable in that approach to combat makes you feel comfortable. There aren't any stakes to the inevitability of your own demise. The idea of survival is thrown out the window when you combat a behemoth with only a knife knowing the ins and out of your enemy. It's a bit ridiculous at times that the feats Alex can pull off that I completely felt that I was playing a new game entirely. The frustration towards the gameplay only embellishes more of that lack of innovation when you realize that much of the time you're probably mashing the attack button to where you can just unlock an enemy until you finish them. Dodging into a blind spot where they can't see you exposes this exploit to where you figure out quickly that much of those mechanics that founded that action in its design falls flat as it becomes repetitive very quickly, and you become quite bored. Not only the monsters but even the Order cult members show how fundamentally flawed that system is. It's laughably bad how the player can capitalize on this method and rinse and repeat. None of the other weapons matter when the knife becomes notable to being the standard weapon that does the best damage output. This alone expresses much of my dismay when it comes to the gameplay in itself. The biggest problem that Silent Hill Homecoming faces is its direction that favors a more modern action-oriented approach. With too much familiarity with trying to rewrite what's already been written, with its own ideas that completely breaks the immersion of Silent Hill as a concept. The more I progressed throughout the game, the more I felt disconnected from the lore, the themes, the characters, the atmosphere, and the identity that is Silent Hill. This was not a Silent Hill game anymore. It was a new game entirely. I had the seeds planted to grow into something more, but it didn't amount to the potential it deserved. With the previous entries covered, my expectations for the next entry in the Western Silent Hill games were very non-existent and thought it would be below an average at best. However, the next entry only subverted my expectations by completely shattering them with the integration of innovation that shocked me throughout my whole experience with Silent Hill Shatter Memories. Like reuniting with an old high school friend years later, Climax Studios would once again step up to the plate and take the helm of creating another game for the Silent Hill franchise. However, this time around it would be completely different as it has little to nothing to do with Silent Hill. In a turn of events, Climax Studios opted to go in the opposite direction by embracing an alternative story that captures the scope of the original Silent Hill, but with a complete reimagining that would be a surprise to everyone. Silent Hill Shatter Memories would adopt the premise of the original Silent Hill, featuring the notable protagonist Harry Mason trying to find his daughter, Cheryl Mason, after a horrible car accident that has them stumble to the town of Silent Hill. Where's Cheryl? Still at the lighthouse, maybe. Lighthouse? What are you doing here, Harry? Looking for Cheryl. Isn't this my house? Who are you? This would see Harry go on a cold journey through the town where everything is covered in snow or ice, a motif that would be the theme for setting the overall environment as opposed to the iconic fog that is seen in prior entries. Taking his path would be an emphasis on exploration with the use of a flashlight and cell phone as your only resources this time around. With this, the so frequent interaction with the other characters alike from the original cast, such as Dr. Kaufman, Sybil Bennett, Dahlia Glepsi, and Lisa Garland, along with new faces. Everything seems to be going in the direction of the original story, but is rather merely a setup to set the groundwork for an entirely new story that has so much emotional depth behind the narrative, an innovation to the gameplay's mechanics, and one of the most unique and atmospheric settings I've ever seen in a Silent Hill game. If not, one of the most unique Silent Hills out of all the entries before and after it. This is solely due in part to the gameplay fundamentals, taking complete departure from the typical survival horror that we've grown accustomed to. Instead, 
favoring the aforementioned urban exploration, as well as an entirely new feature that sees psychotherapy sessions with Dr. Kaufman. Much of the narrative this time around is actually written by the player. Not literally speaking, but figuratively, as your choices to the gameplay will matter as it will impact the overarching narrative, resulting in one of five endings that will be determined on your actions. This will split into two parts, partaking in these therapy sessions and interacting with the environment and characters. like we know each other and I've never seen you before in my life. Seriously? You are screwed up. It was a complete shift that may come off as a departure from the series that would come off as inauthentic to the material or not staying true to the concept of Silent Hill. While this is true to some extent, it makes up for this by completely overhauling the gameplay with a fundamentally groundbreaking innovative design that always keeps the player's interest compelled which is what makes the experience worthwhile. The noteworthy feature is that of the therapy sessions of Dr. Kaufman. In these, you presumably play the role of Harry Mason. Undergoing these therapies where your interaction with Dr. Kaufman matters as much of your interactivity will play much of a detrimental role in the effects of the story. Let's take a different tack. On the table, I've laid out a blank timetable and some cards with lessons on them. Pick out the lessons to show me your perfect school day. Don't leave any empty. There are only four periods, and I've allocated a very generous lunch. One of the most intuitive designs I've seen not just in Silent Hill, but gameplay in a survival horror game in general, is this emphasis on interaction which will dictate outcomes unbeknownst to the player. This is never once mentioned, but rather implied as looking around the environment, choosing and responding honestly, or showing any value nor care to the session will integrate into the overarching plot that is very subtle in its detail. It's not only seen in the therapy sessions, but also in the aforementioned exploration of the town of Silent Hill. Playing as Harry will allow you to have freedom of traversal in linear or open environments, such as crossing large gaps or jumping over walls. Furthermore, the player will also interact with practically everything the environment has to offer, with the most obvious in its spectacle or the most minute details of items. I was shocked by how much innovation the cell phone capitalized on with such features that paid much attention to the overall environment, which you wouldn't expect, but would come to surprise you. As previously mentioned, the cell phone plays a foundation in your gameplay as a resource to receive calls, messages, or voicemails from the characters you've previously interacted with that will periodically conversate with Harry. Depending on your actions of either picking up the phone to check on your notifications or choosing to ignore them will also matter as well in regards to the narrative. Let's get moving. Okay. I love the use of the camera being used to take photos of supernatural entities that may come off as creepy in some instances, but in reality are memories of the past, uniquely capturing the psychological nature of the atmosphere with such a feature as this. Visualizing emotionally gripping moments that evaluate the cherished and treasured memories that Harry captures of his daughter, Cheryl. It captures so much depth that you wouldn't expect from such a minuscule device that you wouldn't think much of, but it does just that. Lots of this seeks that attention to detail, and literally everything this gameplay has to offer that I imagine that much of my playthrough I missed out on a lot and probably have yet to see new unique features that push for the incentive to allow such replayability. And while all this is grand in its scope, it's not without its flaws. Because of the detraction from the concept of the series founded on such as the monsters, cult-like religious themes, or the foggy, mysterious town that is Silent Hill itself, it does heavily downplay the horror. The enemy roster is practically non-existent, downsizing to one enemy this time around that is specific in crescendo events in the chase sequences. This is by far the weakest element in the gameplay that sounds enticing at first because it creates this tension and pressure on the player's behalf of having nothing to defend themselves in such combat, but rather desperation of survival of you running away from your pursuer. It's this version of the other world where you'll have to traverse through previous settings you explored and usually have to backtrack and alter pathways to get to the exit to escape the monsters. It's very overwhelming at first as it creates excitement in the chase, but like eating the same food over and over again, it becomes stale and boring. It's personally something that I define too much of a problem with, as opposed to someone who loves the previous Silent Hill games with its archaic approach to the tank controls and a fixed dynamic camera angle. 
While it did get tiresome quickly, as you'll see the repetitious nature of the same enemies, the same structure to the environment, albeit different locations, and the goal to get to the end, it wasn't something I would say is lazy nor uninspired. If anything, it was just more so a different focus when it came to prioritizing the gameplay. But there are so many more pros here that far await the cons that I couldn't find myself displeased for one second throughout my journey through Silent Hill Shattered Memories. There is so much meticulous detail in the gameplay that the player wouldn't come to find because the game gaslights the player into thinking into a certain state of mind, with how the characters are structured that are solely to create this subversion of expectations. It's very subtle in its approach to the design, that you have to pay close attention to the dialogue, interaction, and choices the player makes when it comes to the mannerisms and tones the characters suggest through an interacting that may come to confuse the player, such as the therapy sessions with Dr. Kaufman. I love how he comes off as calm and soft with his tone in the beginning, sounding sincere and genuine, but you could tell by the subtle mannerisms and gestures he does that make him come off as imposing or menacing by paying close attention. This continues to play into this theme where he stands tall or walks around the room to show his authority over the patient, asserting his dominance with his smug demeanor and sly attitude. It's a reflection of how a patient may feel about therapy sessions with a new therapist they may take a defensive approach to, with the mentality thinking therapists are pretentious in their knowledge they hold, or that therapy is a waste of time and isn't needed. It's thoughts anyone would feel to someone whom they don't know when they are in a vulnerable state of mind. It gaslights the player into becoming cautious and weary of creating this trust they have. This is one of the more profound instances of subversion of expectations. If only I had acted differently. If only I hadn't said that. If only I'd said something. You beat yourself up with your past. Don't blame yourself. Blame the world. Blame God. Blame me. Especially when you realize the plot twist when all the events that occurred over the gameplay were just a mere coping mechanism Cheryl Mason created over the loss of her father. Creating this physical manifestation of an inconsistent and compromised fractured memory to repress the trauma and tragedy she endured for the past 18 years, realizing the true horror was ourself. Our inability to move on and let go from our loss and grief, creating this beautiful yet depressing imagery of one's humanity they hold on to deeply. It's such a masterfully done execution of the resolution that generally left me in awe. And that's what I think makes Silent Hill Shatter Memories one of the most innovative Silent Hill games mechanically and narratively speaking, with its depth in conveying such emotional storytelling through fundamental gameplay design. The irony is that it doesn't feel like a Silent Hill game, if anything, a new game that is entirely part of a different pre-existing franchise. But even if it isn't faithful overall to the concept, it still takes those ideas and creates something entirely new, and builds upon its former to create this identity for itself. To be completely honest, I can't really articulate my thoughts and feelings when it comes to my time with Silent Hill Downpour, the next western Silent Hill game and also the final installment in the series, at least with the context of that time period before taking an indefinite hiatus for over a decade up until nowadays of the revival of Silent Hill. An analogy to convey what I feel is that it felt like riding a roller coaster, a roller coaster that should have had excitement thrill and joy to the overall ride itself, but all I felt were such lows that never once went high nor had any creativity in their layout and design. I lacked all the integral features that made a roller coaster ride fun. In the end, all I felt was emptiness. It was just a waste of my time. You would think, after the reception of Silent Hill Shatter Memories, there would be a step in the right direction, or see the return of Climax Studios, considering their creative approach was intuitive in creating this diverse atmosphere while still paying tribute to the likes of Silent Hill would be a given, but to much of our surprise and displeasure, we would be solely mistaken. The next on the list would be an unknown startup video game company from the Czech Republic called Batra Games, 
They would be known for only one other game on their portfolio, whilst Silent Hill Downpour would be the last game they would develop as they would go bankrupt in 2012. In Silent Hill Downpour, you play as the protagonist Murphy Pendleton, a recently incarcerated inmate who's been convicted of a crime that has not yet been revealed to the player. However, given the opening, we can initially expect that Murphy is one who is out for revenge and bloodlust, as you can execute and kill another inmate for story purposes, and also to serve as a tutorial for combat. This is a good setup and concept to play a character who revolves around crimes and prisons as it gives a much more gritty and darker tone, as this already gives the impression that he is a vengeful person. And you would think this, but nothing of that characterization is utilized here in the story, as it's traded off for a more sympathetic and tragic backstory as it's revealed that Murphy is wrongfully imprisoned, yet rightfully imprisoned for not actually killing anyone, but rather just stealing a cop car. So when you take this into account with this reveal later on, then it becomes a fortuitous and such missed opportunity to the player. There is potential to once again do an interesting narrative that didn't have to follow the same formula of Homecoming and Silent Hill 2, where we see a deeply tragic backstory of a character having to go through this journey of loss and acceptance by facing their fears that becomes physical manifestations in the town of Silent Hill. It becomes stale and made me want to see something different for once, but that's what we got. But getting back to the story, essentially, Murphy undergoes a prison transfer where he gets into a car accident, allowing him to escape while also being pursued by this cop lady who, honestly, I forgot the name of, because much of these characters are forgettable and not properly utilized well, to where he has to traverse through the town of Silent Hill in order to escape. It's a pretty basic concept that is reasonable, as I imagine anyone who finds himself trapped in Sunland Hill would also want to escape as well. But there isn't much of an incentive for Murphy to be here, he just coincidentally happens to find himself here. I guess you could argue that his tragic backstory of losing his son due to him being murdered and wanting revenge could be a reason. But then you remember that he never killed anyone. He is just some guy who was unfortunate enough to find himself in Sunland Hill, where his fears get manifested into reality. I guess if we wanted to find a reason, then maybe him escaping Silent Hill is symbolic of him escaping from his past that is littered with tragedy and emotional baggage, but that's honestly all I could take from this. Much of this feels uninspired and somewhat lazy. Finding a reason to allow this character to be here for the sake of being here because it's Silent Hill, and without it, then it wouldn't be a Silent Hill game. This is ironic given the previous team Silent Hill games took the player away from Silent Hill, and put them in an entirely new setting, and even then they accomplished in facilitating that concept, because they realized that maybe the town became an overdone trope and was an exhausted idea. Speaking of uninspired and lazy ideas, it's hard not to mention the gameplay design when it comes to Silent Hill Downpour. This is by far the worst I've ever seen when it comes to the overall approach to the gameplay mechanically and artistically, a great example of this is the enemy design. This embellishes such a lazy and disheartening approach to the typical enemy design we've grown accustomed to from previous entries that it's honestly shocking how this even made it to the final game. These enemies look like something out of a haunted house or a horror attraction that doesn't look remotely unsettling or ominous and come off as cheap and tacky. Many of these designs feel too human and don't incorporate many themes that are symbolic in nature and are a reflection of the protagonist or of the town inhabitants that you would see from the previous titles. Those who had a purpose and meaning as to why the monsters existed because they were physical manifestations of the human subconscious that inherited such desires, traumas, and fears, which is what made the enemy design so unique and distinguishable. As opposed to here, where they just feel like they thought that something they watched from a slasher film was a great idea to incorporate into Silent Hill and call it a day. It completely misses the point of why there is such a necessary element that makes up the horror atmosphere, just merely exists for the sake of difficulty and being an obstacle in player progression. Much of this lack of direction can be seen in not only enemy design, but also the combat. Combat admittedly does harken back to the classic survival horror we've seen in the series, taking a step in the right direction by disassociating from the action-oriented combat scene in Silent Hill Homecoming, and rather having a much more grounded approach that is a return to form. This may come off as a positive, but this fumbles everything by making weapons breakable after a period of use, not allowing inventory management to store the various weapons you find throughout exploration. 
demanding specific weapons to break down boarded doorways to progress when any weapon should be allowed to do such an action, having to drop weapons and only allowing one weapon to be held. I can't understand why the developers would take this approach when it doesn't make the game at all innovative, which allows the player incentive for experimentation, but rather produces frustration and confusion. My reasoning is that this limitation created this immersion of feeling closer to the survival horror with this pressure and tension when combating against an enemy, but I didn't feel this at all. I just felt a bitter taste in my mouth. I think what would have been innovative is playing into that prison motif by having Murphy use his prison smarts as an advantage against his enemies. If not enemies, then exploration in the environments when undergoing level progression. Technically, this does play out in the other world, which does a great job at creating that immersion, but that quickly loses merit when you undergo these chase sequences by a floating void that chases you. I wish I were making this up. It disengages the player from the atmosphere and doesn't allow this facilitation in this world to truly appreciate it. Technically, you can when the game gives you time to breathe a bit, but it's very short. It's the only thing that is remotely interesting, but just feels like a spectacle that is there for the sake of appeasing the player, as it's in the vein of Silent Hill. This is true, but there has to be purpose and reason behind it. And that's honestly what Silent Hill Downpour feels like much of the time to me. Just spectacle. Putting up these grandiose events that have this marvelous and massive backdrop that compels the player by the environment itself. It grabs your attention for a second, but it can only do this for so long as over time it will quickly begin to show how empty it feels. There isn't much life in these environments. It just feels like it's overcompensating for something more ambitious, when there isn't any payoff that is worthwhile to the player. It's just merely masking for lack of inspiration or direction in the creative department. Silent Hill Downpour is a game that I had a miserable time with. I blame myself slightly for marathoning these games back to back in the span of a week, where I'm sure I was exhausted by this time I played this entry. But even if I allowed myself days or weeks to take a break from the Western Silent Hill games, I'm sure I would still find my experience in a negative manner. Much of my time I was just on autopilot mode and had no thoughts, just my head empty. I just wanted the game to end and play something else. If there was a perfect way to personify Silent Hill Downpour, it would be that it just takes one step forward, but two steps back. And there you have it, reviewing every Western Silent Hill game. With my time spent on these games, there were highs and lows, but in the end, the general consensus is that much of these games are just mediocre at best. With the exception of Silent Hill Shattered Memories for its direction and gameplay and narrative with its unique innovation to the formula. But even then, it had to be disassociated from Silent Hill in order to work. It's probably the only game I'd recommend playing as it allows for lots of replay value. Silent Hill Origins 2 if you like the classic survival horror with the archaic tank controls and fixed dynamic camera angles. But other than that, I really wouldn't recommend anything else, unless you want to experience these games for the first time. But I don't find myself playing these games for a very, very long time. I want to thank my channel members for joining the channel membership, Specky Bandit and Francis Andrew Lugo. If you're interested for just $1 a month, you get access to loyalty badges, emojis, and your name in the credits of my videos. I also want to thank all of you for getting us to 2,000 subscribers. This is honestly so unbelievable to see for me, but I'm very grateful that my content is meaningful and hopefully worthwhile to people like yourself. If you guys enjoyed this video and also have ideas of reviewing every game in a survival horror franchise, then please feel free to let me know. I usually interact with our community very frequently and do polls on what videos I should cover next. Anyways, that's me. Thank you for watching. Please have a great day, stay safe, and goodbye.